on behalf of the appellant, David Greathouse. May it please the court, I would like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal argument. As the court has had an opportunity uh, to read our merit brief on this matter, uh, I think the simplest way to sum up the arguments that I've made in that brief, both all three assignments, is that it is sort of a domino theory. The domino theory being, of course, that if this court were to sustain uh, either assignment of error number one or number two, that assignment of error number three, which was a denial of the motion to sever, would thereafter have to be granted or also sustained. The first assignment of error obviously is a pre-indictment delay argument, and the second is more of a bad faith preservation of evidence argument. Uh, both find their foundation in the due process clause of the U.S. Uh, Constitution, and essentially what this case boils down to is whether or not uh, Mr. Greathouse, the appellant, was given a fair opportunity to litigate his cases at the trial court level. As I articulated in my brief, uh, the primary and uh, seminal case for the pre-indictment delay is U.S. v. Lovasco. The first prong that has to be met is whether or not there was actual prejudice to Mr. Greathouse by the delaying of the indictment in this case. I would submit to the court, as I did in my brief, that there is in fact been actual prejudice. Uh, uh, none really greater than the fact that there, the primary witness that would have been used at trial, Roberta Greathouse, who was the appellant's mother, had passed away long before this case even came to be indicted. Uh, in addition to that, as a court can, can, can glean from my brief, there is a lot of argument regarding a prescription sheet of paper on it as a diagnosis from a Dr. McDonald's who was also unable to be located prior to this trial. And Dr. McDonald's diagnosis, of course, and I believe it was submitted along with the record, is that there were no physical findings of abuse to the alleged victim from the investigation in 2000, whose name was And essentially what all the arguments boil down to with regard to that particular assignment of error, Your Honors, is that the case was investigated, it was concluded after a meeting with the Barberton City Law Department in the year 2000 that there was insufficient evidence to prosecute Mr. Greathouse at that point in time. Thirteen years later, an allegation is made against Mr. Greathouse with regard to his stepdaughter. That case was no bill initially, and it wasn't until that point in time that Detective Storrad of the Summit County uh, Sheriff's Office decided to search for more information. At that point, he had a conversation with the then Barberton Police uh, Detective, Detective Hudak, and in that discussion, I guess it was determined that there may have been allegations from the year 2000. From the year 2000 to the year 2013, there is literally no additional information that was uncovered with regard to the investigation of the allegations in uh, the incidents from 2000. There was no additional statements given. There was no additional physical findings given. There was no additional testimony given. I would say that some of it may be morphed over the course of 13 years, but at its crux, nothing changed, nothing new occurred. And what essentially happened is the state of Ohio, the government used that investigation and piggybacked it along with the one that they could not get a true bill for and got them both indicted in the same count. The second assignment of error, Your Honors, and probably the, the, the more applicable of the due process arguments, falls under Arizona v. Youngboy. And in that case, I believe that the Supreme Court of the United States passed down a propositional law that very simply states that if law enforcement, not necessarily the prosecutor's office, acts in bad faith in and not preserving evidence that could be potentially useful, useful to the defense, then in fact, the defendant's due process rights have been violated. And at its most basic level, Your Honor, this prescription sheet of paper with the diagnosis from Dr. McDonald was in the possession of the Barberton Police Department from the year 2000 all the way through the trial, and now it's in this court's possession. At no point in time in the two years leading up to the trial was that document turned over until the defense started to present its case in chief. And what really became problematic in this case, Your Honors, is that 
Detective Hudak, when contacted by Detective Storad in this situation, faxed over his entire file to Detective Storad. When Detective Storad testified, he indicated that he received the entire file and he did not have that prescription pad or prescription sheet of paper with the diagnosis on it. When Detective Hudak was subpoenaed, he also indicated that he did not recall receiving that notepad. He also did not bring his entire investigative file at the trial to the trial, and he testified that he never really reviewed it or saw that file. It wasn't until the defense subpoenaed the now, or at that point in time, lead detective, Lieutenant Jameson, to court where the entire investigative file was presented to the judge. When that entire investigative file was presented, the prescription sheet of paper with the diagnosis from Dr. McDonald magically appeared. I mean, the state's argument is that the original document was in the possession of the defendant prior to trial, so in the possession of his family since 2000, is what they're saying. So how are you refuting their allegation that the original document had been with the defendant since 2000? Well, the def it was never in the defendant's possession. It was actually in his mother's possession. And his mother kept a copy of the document unbeknownst to the defendant. So the defendant was unaware that this document, had, that his mother maintained a copy of it. And so what happened is he discovered it when he was going through her belongings at the uh, Christmas time in 2014, which was about two months before this occurred. The defendant knew that the child had been taken to a physician, knew that a diagnosis was made with regard to no physical findings of abuse, but did not know where any of that documentation was. The defense went through the normal channels of trying to procure that document, which was essentially filing a subpoena with Akron Children's Hospital, because it was known to them, or at least they believed that Dr. McDonald, the diagnosing physician, his practice had been absorbed into Akron Children's Hospital. And through all that, they were unable to determine uh, what happened to that diagnosis on the piece of paper. And in that same vein, the state never turned that sheet of paper over. And by all accounts, when you read Detective Storad's testimony, or not Detective Storad, Detective, uh, or Lieutenant Jameson's testimony, it is abundantly clear that he simply grabbed the investigative file, reviewed it, brought it to court, and this piece of paper was in the file. So at some point, either Lieutenant Jameson, or not Lieutenant Jameson, Detective Kudak, when he faxed his file to Detective Storad, removed that prescription piece of paper, or in the alternative, Detective Storad disregarded it. Which obviously is particularly troublesome because they, that would indicate that the police knew about it and chose not to provide that to the defense and obviously substantially hampered their ability to go find the diagnosing physician as well as to go find other people. Medically, 
and one, he, he for some reason never is notified of what the diagnosis is, but his mother is, which makes no sense. And then two, that this prescription pad is the way that a doctor would even make this notation, that they would write it on a prescription pad as opposed to a report. And then you'd have to believe that even though his mother saved it for 13 years, she never told her son what it said. That makes absolutely no sense. As a mother, why she had that documentation instead of uh, David, I have no idea. And two, if it was exculpatory and exonerated him on such a serious allegation, if, if which findings of physical abuse are, uh, no finding of physical abuse in these type of cases, the testimony was about 90% of the time there isn't any finding anyway, even though there is abuse. So I'm not saying that evidence would be exonerating anyway. If she had it, there's no reason why she wouldn't show her son. So you have to buy this completely implausible theory, which there's nothing in the record to support other than, um, you know, this, these, these allegations basically and the self-serving assertions by Mr. Greathouse that he found it in his mother's belongings and he had no idea that it existed. So there, there's no way that Mr. Greathouse can show that, that there was any prejudice that came to him because somehow this photocopy prescription pad, um, prescription, somehow, for whatever reason, did not go from one detective to the other, and certainly the prosecutor's office never had it. Um, in light of the fact that there was evidence that at least one of the detectives did have this note, which hasn't been authenticated, which no one can show you know, if it actually was written down by Dr. McDonald and or when it came into existence, even though it's dated 2000, the state still acquiesced to having that documentation go before the jury. So there really is no way he can show prejudice. There's the, the evidence that he wanted to come before the court still came before the court. The jury found it obviously to be something that lacked credibility and or was not uh, dispositive of the issue as the evidence was presented and this court is aware that many times in these type of cases, there is no physical finding of abuse. So based on, based on those um, arguments and the uh, the rest of the items in my brief, I, unless there are any questions, I'll rest on the brief. Thank you, Your Honor. As I spent a great deal of time with this case, I was quite troubled with how to argue it, how to present the information to the court. I think as lawyers, we all have fallacies. We get caught up in the facts. We get caught up in the law. And sometimes we go down the wormhole. When I asked an older lawyer in my office to help me understand what due process was, how would he describe it to somebody who he just met on the street, his response was, it's about fundamental fairness. And when I sat back in my desk after I heard him say that, I tried to understand what was fair about these proceedings. How was Mr. Greathouse treated fairly? and simply stated, I do not believe he was treated fairly in this situation. The fact remains, to wait 13 years to indict an individual and then attempt to do it when there's been no new evidence after you've elected not to do it, and the only reason you did it is because magically you needed to get a true bill in another case that you could not get a true bill in. That strikes me as somewhat appalling. I also look, and I ask the court to look, at the March 11, 2013 severance hearing transcript. And the testimony of Detective Hudak in that case, or in that, at, the, at that hearing, is also particularly, particularly troubling to me. Because only nine months or 11 months later, his testimony completely changed. He testified in front of the court at the severance hearing that this case was not brought to the grand jury in 2000 because after meeting with the Barber Law Department, they didn't have probable cause. They didn't have the dogs to hunt. When he came to testify at trial, he couldn't remember why they didn't prosecute this case. He had no recollection. Similarly, Detective Hudak said the case was inactive at the severance hearing. When he testified before the trial in front of the jury at the most important moment, only 11 months later, he could not remember why, in fact, the case, the, what the designation on the case was. He said, I don't know. It's, it's been open for 13 years, which is in complete conflict with what he said. It's those little 
issues and statements and inconsistencies, coupled with the fact that this document that clearly was exculpatory never made it to the prosecutor's office. And when I look at Arizona v. Youngblood, it doesn't say the prosecutors, it says law enforcement, the police. When a police officer uses the opportunity that he has to, pre to prevent potentially useful, not exculpatory, but potentially useful information from getting to the defense, that is a violation of due process. That is a violation of an individual's fundamental right to fairness. And when you couple the fact that these two cases were tried together, I'm sure the court at the time may not have been aware of how convoluted these two, this situation could have gotten, but it did get that way. They should have been severed. Anytime you have two allegations, I think common sense dictates that where there's smoke, there's fire. We had that expression for a reason. It's not like we pulled it out of thin air. The fact remains is that when you put these two allegations together, you have a scenario where a jury is going to be more likely to convict somebody, not necessarily because they did it, not necessarily because the evidence suggests it, but because where there's smoke, there's fire. And the state even argued that in their closing argument. They talked about it in voir dire. They know that they had that upper hand. That, in my opinion, is fundamentally unfair. That's what due process is used to prevent. Assignment of error number one and assignment of error number two emerge not necessarily through the Supreme Court, but when a federal judge 30 years ago said, you know what, something doesn't smell right about the way the government's prosecuting these cases. And then it morphed into these two different theories. And I'm asking the court, pleading with the court, begging with the court to overturn Mr. Greathouse's conviction on count one and also to overturn the convictions on the, count, on the remaining counts simply because count one's conviction was in violation of the due process rights. All the rest were in violation of his right to sever the two. And I believe it was a, a snowball rolling down hill. What the state did in this case was fundamentally unfair and somewhat offensive to Mr. Mr. Greathouse's constitutional rights.